forward to joining academia in 2020, and she's a lecturer in, in pathology and medicine and applied pharmacology at the University of Johannesburg. She's been a member of the Eugenius Club since 2017 and ranked within the highest percentile of academic performers at the university. So it appears she's put her best foot forward already. Maybe this is the second time. Uh, all I know, before I, before I put my foot in my mouth, let me ask Yasira to join us on stage. Jazakla. Assalamu alaikum. There was very tough acts to follow. I will try my best to keep up and keep the script because if I have to lecture you like I lecture my students, we will all miss the gala. So, primary healthcare in South Africa is primarily nurse driven, focusing on illness prevention, disease promotion, and treatment of acute and chronic conditions. The health department manages various health services, including primary, secondary, and tertiary healthcare centers. Primary health care is ideal for early detection and management of diabetic foot complications. Podiatrists diagnose, treat, and manage lower limb and foot diseases, and their role in preventing complications like ulceration and amputation is underutilized. Despite the need for podiatrists in primary health care, they are not included in the relevant strategies to drive inclusion as seen in the omission from the draft human resources in the Health 2030 document. Diabetes causes half of all amputations and is primarily due to infected diabetic foot ulcers. Early treatment and identification of risk factors can improve prevention and treatment outcomes. Clinicians can reduce lower extremity amputations risk through comprehensive history and foot examination. The study highlighted that the number of diabetic foots presenting at primary health care centers and the percentages of those who already have diabetic foot complications that occur in primary health care facilities. The distinctions between males and females is, a, is critical since research overseas has shown that diabetes is more common among males than females. However, the study found that most patients that present at primary health care level are predominantly female. In this study, data was collected from 566 patient files who had presented across all three primary health care centers that had diabetic foot complications. This number signals or confirms that patients presenting at primary health care with diabetic foot complications. In addition, having podiatrists at this level of health care can help reduce primary and secondary amputation and prevent amputation in the remaining limb. Podiatrists at primary health care level could drive diabetic foot screening, early identification of risk factors, and foot health education initiatives and provide preventative treatments. The current district health services in South Africa mandates that these preventative strategies or interventions be available at primary health care level. Without these structured interventions, patients at primary health care level risk developing severe complications and may even result in losing a limb for some. However, podiatric services are unavailable in all primary health care centers in South Africa, except for a few in Gauteng. In cases where they are available, they remain poorly structured and ignored or unknown by other healthcare professionals in the center. Without structured health food services, one might argue that the diabetic patient is not given quality care in the lower levels of care in the healthcare system as it at present. As already stated, this failure could increase the number of amputations. I argue that the continuing exclusion of podiatrists from the primary health care team has resulted in a lack of or severely limited preventative foot health interventions in most primary health care settings. The status quo should not be left unchanged if there is any hope of making a significant impact in the care of diabetic patients in South Africa. The prevention of diabetic foot should be the primary line of defense. This may be accomplished by identifying people at high risk, such as those with peripheral neuropathy, peripheral vascular disease, or foot abnormalities, among a whole host of other things. In this study, 23% of patients experienced tingling, 13% experienced numbness, and a further 13% reported burning feet. It highlighted the lack of data on diabetic foot-related complications in the primary health care centers, 
and suggests that the need for foot structured health services primarily driven by podiatrists again. Because of nurses' heavy workloads and training gaps, they cannot perform diabetic foot evaluations and screenings and implement an adequate management plan. A structured podiatry service at primary health care level can educate patients, carers, and healthcare professionals about foot health. Podiatrists can train nurses to conduct early assessments, identify at risk feet, and referring patients for interventions. A thorough screening and management plan can prevent serious diabetic foot problems and reduce amputation incidents. The current study found that 536 patients who were part of it were inadequately assessed concerning their foot complaint. The patient file review in the study highlighted the poor capture of foot health related complaints or pathologies in patients seen by nurses at primary health care level. This finding highlights that these patients risk as their complaints may be overlooked, incorrectly captured, or ignored completely during the consultation. There are poorly defined referral pathways for patients with diabetic foot complications. The study has highlighted evidence that numerous diabetic foot complications are present at primary health care level. However, the data demonstrates that the referral system is failing them. There is no network of communication around the referral system. Nurses are unaware of podiatrists' foot health services available even at tertiary hospitals such as Charlotte McKeke Academic Hospital, Baraguana, and even Helen Joseph, amongst others. These podiatrists play a vital role in the referral system because they have the resources and expertise to be the diabetic foot's gatekeeper. To conclude, in South Africa, there are major challenges as far as management of the diabetic foot goes. A significant segment of the patient population is systematically and structurally overlooked. This is a quantifiable finding of the study and not coincidental. Diabetic patients with foot issues are being neglected across, across the country, which is a growing concern. My question to you is, who is overseeing these patients? Sakala. Jazakla Yasira for that very, very sobering uh, lecture. I just want to make an announcement that uh, we definitely will finish on time uh, and we will finish in time for everyone to make salah. So no need to leave early. Uh, our next speaker, Jazakla, for joining us today is uh, Dr. Mohamed Khalil. He's a consultant surgeon. He's head of Unit 3 at Helen Joseph Hospital. He's certified in bariatric surgery. Um, he's been been a very active member of uh, the academic training of registrars and fellows at uh, Helen Joseph Hospital and University of Watsonstrand. And I'm going to hand over to him to speak to us about metabolic and bariatric surgery. Jazakla. Thanks for a kind introduction, Farooq. Um, and thanks to the management for the honor. Um, Salaamu Alaikum to my esteemed colleagues. Um, I'll just start straight away. We get running late. Um, looking at the magnitude of the problem of overweight and obesity, my, my colleague uh, Zahir has mentioned a lot about it. Uh, if we look at the World Obesity Fe Federation figures of 2020, 800 million people were obese or overweight. Uh, out of those, 39 million people uh, were children under the age of five, and 340 million children uh, are the children and adolescents. In South Africa, prevalence is rising and is one of the highest in sub-Saharan Africa. In 2002, 56% of the women and 29% of the one men, women were either overweight or obese. Uh, by the end of 2016, these race rates has risen to 68% of the women and 31% of the men. Um, looking at some of the definitions, body mass index is measured as weight in kilograms divided by height in meters squared. And the term severe obesity rather than morbid obesity or extreme obesity is more appropriate for a BMI above 40 kilogram. These are the, the definition accepted internationally and replaced, replaced all other definition for all practical and scientific purpose. Um, based on those definitions, we have categories of uh, three categories of obesity. Category three is severe obesity more than 40 BMI. Category two is uh, obesity. The BMI is 35, from 35 to 39.9. .9.
Category one is obesity. The BMI is 30 from, uh, from 30 to 34.9. Um, if you look at the potential decline in life expectancy in the 21st of the century, this is the article which is, I think is very telling. It talks about large number of studies. This is a prospective study consortium. It talks about 900,000 900, uh, adults which were uh, studied prospectively in 57 studies. Uh, BMI versus, versus death rate was followed and follow-up was done for five to eight years and mortality was 30% greater for each fee, five BMI points above 25 independent of the age and the life expectancy was decreased by three years even with class one obesity. Another uh, publication in 2015, published in 2015 by Global Burden of Disease, Obesity Collaborations, they studied health, health effect of overweight and obesity in 195 countries over 25 years. The data of 2015 showed that high BMI contributed to 120 million disability adjusted life years. And that has, and 4.9% of those disability adjusted life years that is 4.9% 4, 4 of the di disability adjusted life year among all causes of uh, disability. And 37%, that was very scary, 37% of the disability adjusted life years actually occurred in individual with BMI of less than 30. Uh, similarly, the uh, death burden in these patients in 2015, high BMI contributed to 4 million deaths. That represented 7.1% of the deaths from any cause globally. And again, 39% of the, those deaths um, occurred in people with a BMI less than 30. Um, if you look at the causes of obesity, is actually nexus of communal and individual factors divided into non-modifiable and modifiable factors. We have uh, modify, non-modifiable factors, which are genetic mutations in the genes, in the DNA related to the energy metabolism in the body. Then modifiable factors, epigenetic causes, physical inactivity. We all know excessive calorie intake in the form of um, um, ultra processed food and high carbohydrates, insufficient sleep, drugs causing obesity, medical conditions in insulinoma, type two diabetes, um, um, Cushing syndromes, hypothyroidism contribute to obesity, psychological stress, uh, endocrine disrupting chemicals and gastrointestinal microbiomes also include to the uh, obesity. Um, again, this has been touched by my colleague Zahir, um, just going through the important uh, oncological conditions, excessive level of estrogen causes or contribute to the ovarian, endometrial, postmenopausal breast cancers. Again, excess levels of insulin and insulin-like uh, growth factors contribute to the cancers of the breast, cervix, pancreas, colorectal cancer, gallbladder, thyroid cancers, and cancer of esophagus because of chronic, because of gastroesophageal reflux disease, and um, that lead to this adenocarcinoma of the esophagus. Um, briefly going through the procedures, two procedures we commonly use, laparoscopic Ruan y gastric bypass, bypasses 95% of the GI tract. The small gastric pouch is created just under the um, the esophagus, this gastric pouch is then connected with the uh, mid jejunum. The remainder of the stomach and intestine remains in the body and exclude from the nutrient flow. And then distal portion of the duodenum is reattached further down with the distal jejunum to allow bile acid and digestive enzyme to reach the nutrients. Um, laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy, nearly 80% of the stomach along the greater curvature is removed create a narrow, narrow tubular stomach and leaving uh, pyrorist structure intact and then this gives the, uh, in sleeve gastrectomy that doesn't involve in intestinal rearrangements so that preserve the nutrient flow and that's the final configuration. Uh, what happens after those two procedures? Um, restrictive, both are restrictive procedures, both bypass and sleeve gastrectomy causes restriction of the food intake, hypoabsorption, we used to call uh, malabsorption, the term replaced now hypoabsorption happens only in um, the gastric bypass. Uh, nutrient handling glucose absorption rate is higher in bypass than 
sleeve gastrectomy protein absorption um, is more in gastric bypass and sleeve gastrectomy is remain unchanged and gastric pouch and sleeve emptying is more in gastric bypass than in, than in sleeve gastrectomy. Uh, looking at the hormonal changes, insulin is increased in bypass more than sleeve. GLP-1 is increased in bypass, in sleeve remain the same. Polypeptide YY hormones remain same in sleeve gastrectomy but increased in uh, gastric bypass. In ghrelin, egg hunger hormone increased more and massively decreased because of the removal of the fundus in sleeve gastrectomy, also decreased in gastric bypass. That's where we now moving on to the, th on to the treatment. We are uh, comparing this, these old results with, with all the medications and the treatment with, uh, with the surgery. And on the basis of many, many randomized controlled trials, medical treatment of the obesity shows very limited short-term success and almost non-existent uh, long-term success. The likelihood that a person will remain, remain um, will lose weight and remain uh, below BMI, BMI for 35 is estimated is 30% or less. The review of clinical trials and lifestyle interventions of obesity prevention and treatment demonstrated that majority of these trials were completely ineffective. Few that were marginally effective had an extremely impact on BMI. Um, surgical treatment comparison, few randomized controlled trials that compare um, um, medical treatment with surgery. Stampede is one of the 11, uh, 11, one of the 12 randomized, randomized controlled trials which shows superiority or superiority of metabolic surgery in terms of increasing insulin sensitivity, a resolution of type 2 diabetes, medication reduction for all complications of the obesity, uh, improvement of lipid, weight loss, and ultimately quality of life. Uh, looking at uh, stampede trials, the curve shows, we can see the medical therapy curve far away from, from both sleeve and gastric bypass, and um, the, the, the HB1, HB1AC level of 6% or less was achieved in 29% of the patients in bypass, in 23% of the patients in sleeve, and medical therapy achieved only 5% of those at that level. Um, if uh, HB1AC level of 7 or less was achieved in 88% of those patients, and that was without insulin. Um, this is another trial, Adams trial or Utah study. Uh, the glucose in milligram per deciliter was measured. This was after 12 years of the treatment. And then that shows, that shows, uh, sorry, that's the surgery group uh, where control group is written. The con that's the surgery group. That shows eight milligram per deciliter decrease in the surgery group. And then we comparing different randomized control trial in the table form, shower Ruan Y gastric bypass and shower laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy is the same as Stampede trial. Then Ikramudin medical therapy versus uh, surgery shows 7% and 38% difference in HB1AC. Uh, those patients achieved depends on the end and the goal, depends on the end point. Mincron in Ruan Y gastric bypass achieved 27%. That was quite high actually, but then surgery group had also achieved 42% of the uh, uh, HB1 AC level, which was less than six. In Simonson's Ru and Y gastric bypass, somehow medical therapy failed to achieve hemoglobin level less than 6.5, uh, but surgery group received 42% 40, of those patients achieved um, six, less than 6.5% 6 6 of the HB1 AC level. Uh, looking at the weight loss in the uh, comparing surgery group versus medical group, again, we can see the curve medical therapy, um, sleeve gastrectomy and Ruan Y gastric bypass. Gastric bypass achieved 23% with this. This again, this is at five years, after five years of the study. Uh, gastric bypass achieved 23% of the uh, weight loss. Sleeve gastrectomy achieved 19% of the weight, weight loss. And we're talking about the total body weight loss. Medical therapy achieved 5% of the weight loss. Um, and obviously drugs in those days, as Zaheer mentioned, obviously were not those drugs. We, do, we didn't have GLP-1 agonists those days. Those were the old drugs. Um, weight loss in SOS studies, 
SO study is a Swedish obese subject study. They included 2010 patient in surgery group and 2037 patient in the control group. The follow-up was in 19, almost 99% of the patient at five years surgery group patient lost 18% of their body weight and that was after 12 years of the surgery and control group only 1% of um, weight loss. Problem in this trial was the by bypass was done only in 13% of the patients. The rest of the procedure, surgical procedure were done, are no longer done nowadays. Um, looking at the, again, weight loss, we can see 26%, almost 27% in bypass, um, which and 11.5% reduction in, in BMI points, which is an in medical group almost non-existent weight loss. Um, again, this is a the comparison of different trials, stampede shower, row and y gastric bypass, and laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy is a stampede, ecramodine, mingrone, and Simonson's. Uh, lot, a huge difference between medical group and surgical group. Um, the mortality decreased, mortality decreased almost 50% in, in surgery group. After that is after 15 years of the follow-up. Um, then the medical group, I'm not going into the details. So one of the most remarkable stories in, in modern medicine has been the absolute superiority of surgery in medical therapy for the treatment of the obesity and its complications. Um, take home message is obesity is a chronic progressive disease and with the serious health related, related complications. I will call, it, call them symptoms. Treatment goal should be treating the disease, not the symptoms. Hypertension is a symptom. Insulin resistance is a symptom. Diabe type 2 diabetes is a symptom. High LDL is a symptom. So we, shouldn't, we must not be treating those symptoms. We actually should be treating the, the cause of the problem, which is obesity. And MBS, uh, metabolic and bariatric surgery, should be considered in individuals with obesity who, by using all non-surgical methods, do not achieve substantial and durable weight loss, and there is no improvement in comorbidities. Thank you very much for your attention. Jazakallah, Dr. Khalil. And thanks for sticking to time. I can see you're really good at cutting out the fat. Um, I think we, we, we are sticking to time quite well, and uh, we will have Maghrib at, officially in Jamaat at quarter past six, so we have quite a few times for, uh, quite a few minutes for questions and answers. Are there any burning questions? It's Aish Jazakla for a very good talk. Uh, I just wanted your opinion. A lot of people are using semaglutide. I'm talking about the non-diabetic patients to lose weight. Uh, what's your opinion on that? Um, there is good data for, for it. Uh, it has registration in almost 40 or 50 countries for weight loss. Uh, it's marketing. So when you use it for weight loss, they rebranded it as Wigovi. Uh, the company has applied for registration for South Africa. But the problem is that Lira Glutide, Sima Glutide, Kagrinitide, Sima all use the same device. So they, the shortage is with the device at the moment, not with the actual drug. Uh, and that's a problem. So it does work for weight loss. It's used off-label. Um, Off-label use doesn't mean illegal, it means that indication has not been approved by SAPRA for South Africa. So I, I, my personal thing is that if you have patients with diabetes who need it, you rather prioritize them at this point in time until we have issues with stocks and put out. Um, so my question is, um, all GRP1 agonists, how, how they work? They basically cause a starvation. Um, and what, then what happened to the proteins? Total protein, body proteins. Then person, person is not having satiety, not eating. Person is not eating both proteins and fat. Um, then what happened to the protein? That's one. And secondly, what happened to the complication, especially paralysis of the stomach, which remained there after many, many, uh, after stopping the treatment many months after that? Um, so so the, the, the good question, these drugs are not without side effects, and, and that's what you have to remember. Uh, I've been using them for about 10 years. Uh, somebody asked me earlier, I've seen two severe cases of pancreatitis. 
both ended up in ICU. So it does occur. Um, the paralysis one is a new one, and, and that's come from two people suing the company in the States. So they've made us aware of it. Uh, gastric paralysis, it's an extremely rare complication. It's almost one in 100,000 at the data that we have currently. So we're not exactly sure. In terms of nutrition, it's not a starvation drug. So if you actually look at patients who, you, you can't do it in humans, obviously, you do it in animal models, where you actually excise the stomach, and it actually has neuronal involvement as well. So if you look at functional MRI, you'll see certain areas of the brain picking up as well. So the five-year study, and there's now seven-year study for liraglutide, there's no decrease in the total protein of the body, neither is there a drop in albumin rates. So we don't see that problem. Um, it's not a pure starvation drug. People can eat through it. Uh, you know, people see my glutide, some patients will tell you, it does nothing for my appetite, but they're still losing weight. I mean, my question is really the same as what Dr. Khalil has asked in terms of uh, are there studies looking at uh, anthropo anthropometry in terms of body composition because uh, and similarly, uh, the same goes for bariatric surgery in terms of uh, anthropometry because we know that frailty is a big issue as you get older in these, in these patients. And if you lose uh, muscle, you're going to have a problem. So do they lose muscle? It's a very good question. And it's not in the side effect profile on the PI. By clinical experience, the elderly patient loses muscle. So we've seen it in our elderly patients who, who lose, they lose fat as well as muscle. Um, they lose much more fat. Obviously, they're losing visceral fat as well. But there is a definite, in some of the patients we've treated in the one clinical trial in a non-diabetic group, they did actually cause sarcopenia in some of the patients. Uh, so my, my personal feeling is that we don't know, or we haven't used the drug consistently enough to see all the side effects because of the erratic supply. Once we start using it consistently over a two to three year period, I'm, I'm pretty sure we're gonna see more side effects than that now. The other one is bone. So there's currently two big bone studies ongoing. Thank shukar alhamdulillah, they hasn't flagged anything on the bone studies because of you, you worry for the sarcopenia, you worry for the muscle mass, then you worry about the nutrient, micronutrient absorption. So, so far it hasn't flagged anything. It's about two, two and a half years into the study. I've got a question for each one of you. Um, um, with regard to the surgery, have you, uh, is there any experience on the, you know, the use of gastric balloons which they're using now? You know, we, Somebody in Durban is doing that. And, and, and that is about those who have lost weight in three months, say if you follow them up after one or two years, how, how well they've been doing. Yes, gastric balloon has been used a lot in the past. Um, the most common procedure performed nowadays is uh, sleeve gastrectomy followed by gastric bypass. Uh, balloon is temporary measure. They, someone, if, if someone will have a balloon, that must be removed. We must have a procedure which will remain there and uh, for for rest of the life. And as soon as in, in balloon you remove the balloon, we remove the balloon and patient gain the weight again. So no longer using it. Um, in terms of weight gain, with GLP alone therapy, so what we have currently, if you don't make any changes to your lifestyle, 100% weight gain once you stop the drug. Uh, if you make changes to your lifestyle, you, you gain about 30% of the weight back. With the newer therapy, so with the triple G therapy, with the once a month injection, one month followed up for 100 days, so it's three months follow up, we only see about 4 to 5% regain of weight. So you, with the new therapies, it seems to be, even after you stop the drug, a, a higher percentage. But with the current ones, the moment you stop the drug, you're going to gain the weight back if you've made no change to your, to your lifestyle. It's not a cure at this point. GLP therapy is not a cure. And you'll find a lot of people are still using it. And that's why we're running out. Because you use it and you think you're going to stop it, but then suddenly you can't stop it because you start gaining weight back. Can you comment on the psychiatric complications of these drugs? Lately, there was an article about suicidal ideation and big warnings about that. 
So cu currently, there's no warning that's been out for it. There's a flag. Uh, there's a major prescription-based study that's come out of the UK and the US. And um, it was in patients who were known with major depressive disorder. So that's where it was underlying it. There, there's anecdotal reports of people and cases where patients who were depressive symptoms got worse afterwards. But can it be a pure side effect? We're not 100% sure. Um, th there is some two studies, one with Lira, uh, one with semaglutide, looking at um, delaying in Alzheimer's. So there's definitely a neuronal effect. If you actually go and do functional MRI or you radio label it and you scan patients afterwards, there's receptors in the brain for GLP, which means there has to be some. Uh, we talk about the hypothalamic influence, we talk about the hedonistic pathways that get blocked and everything, but we don't truly understand where exactly things are. And obesity is that, right? If it was as easy as eating and walking with orbitin, it's not. There's a massive pathway in the brain we don't understand. Hey, sorry, uh, just a, a second question. Uh, I'm actually an anesthesiologist, and uh, we have a lot of these patients coming to theater taking these uh, GLP agonists. Now, there's a case report in the recent anesthetic journals. This was in the States where a woman presented for a lumpectomy of the breast, and the anesthesiologist put in a laryngeal mask airway to maintain the airway. Now, we know that the LMA airway does not protect the airway as compared to an intratracheal tube, and the patient vomited and aspirated. Now, the discussion that is going on is that if these patients are, pre are now presented to theatre for an operative procedure, because of the problem of delayed gastric em emptying, should they be treated as a full stomach? Should they be intubated? Or do you stop the medication? If so, uh, how long do you stop it? The short answer is we don't know. I don't know. Um, the delaying gastric emptying is, in theory, it's four hours. So that's how you will delay gastric emptying. But in clinical practice, it can be up to the next day. So we've seen patients who will actually have a vomitus 24 hours later of their previous meal. So it, in certain patients, it is. It's an emerging area of concern. With the daily one, it's three days. If you stop it within three days, they effect it out of the system. The problem comes in, what happens with a weekly one and a monthly one? How long will that last? But it's an emerging area we don't know. That's the bottom line. So but this is not question actually, this is uh, another comment, you know, for, for protection for diabetes resolution, uh, one should le lose at least 10, uh, 10 kilograms of the weight. And for cancer protection, one lose at least 15% at least of the weight. And, and I'm not sure if GLP-1 agonists, uh, I mean, that, that should be sustained, sustained weight loss, which we achieve with surgery. Uh, I'm not sure if GL, G1, G, GLP-1 agonists uh, can help patient uh, achieve that sustained weight loss after stopping the drugs. So with GLP-1 therapy alone, no. Uh, there's not sustained I, I, earlier. With the newer therapies, yeah. Uh, personally, I think there's a role for bariatric surgery. Uh, we don't know everything about bariatric surgery. For example, resolution of diabetes happens in the first 12 hours. Why? The patient hasn't lost any weight, but the diabetes goes away. Yeah. Yeah, so it, there's a whole lot of issues. I, I think um, for sustained weight loss, bariatric surgery probably will give you a better outcome. And we've now got 20 year follow up data, meta analysis of almost 200,000 patients. With the right surgery, you can have sustained weight loss at 20 years of 89%. So it really, it, it's, it's a phenomenal uh, thing. And currently, metabolic surgery is what, 200,000 patients a year in the US? It's, it's not, uh, people are doing a lot of it. What I would caution is go to Dr. Khalid, go to somebody who's actually registered, who's trained, because there are a lot of people who are doing um, endoscopic balloons or endoscopic staples, and you hear horror stories after that about patients. So you, if you're gonna refer your patient to a bariatric surgeon, somebody who's accredited with an accredited unit, rather than just someone who's taking a chance. Jazakallah uh, Zaid. Last question, Shait. I know we want to chew the fat, literally, for as long as possible, but it's going to be Maghrib and they're going to kill it. And I think, I think it's, a, uh, the, it's, it's that concept of patients accepting that somebody's going to cut me. You know? So I think it's understanding that obesity is a, is a clinical condition. It's a medical condition which needs specific directed therapy, uh, which may include uh, medication. And it's not just that you're, you're a bad eater, you're an unhealthy guy, you're a you're a fatty, you're a piggy. It's not just that. It's there's built-in epigenetic, genetic, behavioral stuff, and our society certainly doesn't help. But I think once patients sort of realize that and becomes a treatment, uh, it I, I would agree. Acceptable. In our, our community, there's three conditions that we still haven't come to terms with: HIV, mental health, 
and obesity. Those three, we, we shun away from it, we ostracize people with it, and we deal with it. We just don't take them seriously. And like Shaib said, I think if you treat each, it's a medical condition that requires therapy. That's the end of story. And once you approach it that way, you've got to break down those barriers in the community. Zakla, that was a fantastic session. Unfortunately, we're going to have to leave any more questions for the next one. Uh, we'll catch it at the end. Zakla.